Catherine Borgeson, please grace us. So stepping away from science. Yes, you got it. Let's go to maps. Maps, history. How about maps? Maps, okay. So there, you may have heard this story often, especially if you're familiar with Los Angeles, that it's almost like a fable. The Los Angeles region used to be actually home to one of the nation's most extensive fixed rail transit systems in the nation. This amazing transportation system was called the red car. And then there was this conspiracy theory that after World War II, General Motors bought the red car and had it dismantled and then built this horrible freeway system that created the sprawl and gridlock, gridlock of today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're familiar with that. And if it sounds familiar, it may be because of the plot from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, or at least the evil scheme that Christopher Lloyd reveals at the end of the movie. theory isn't as ridiculous as it sounds, I'll get to that later, but to understand how the red car created the sprawl and gridlock, we have to go back to the mid-19th century where it started with this guy, Henry Huntington. He was born into a middle-class family in Upper State, New York. Yeah, we're talking the 1850s. So, but he was a nephew to a very wealthy uncle of Collins Harrington. Collins didn't a Collis Harrington. He didn't have any kids, and he took Henry under his wing. He kind of molds Henry into this businessman and teaches him everything about the family business, which is railroads. Uh, Henry does an apprenticeship in San Francisco, and I would love to go on a tangent into the influences that the Huntingtons had in San Francisco, but it's a 10-minute talk focused on Los Angeles, but just... <laughs> to know that there was a lot of influence with this family and he oversees the Market Street Cable Railroad, Railway Company, and uh, he actually, Henry, works his way up to become the vice president of Southern Pacific, his uncle's company. In 1918, 1898, uh, Henry's initial investment into Southern California was uh, the purchase of the biggest transportation system called the Los Angeles Railway, other known a, otherwise known as Larry. <laughs> At this point, he's still predominantly in San Francisco, but in 1900, his uncle Collis dies, and at this point, Henry, he's vice president, and he thinks he's gonna inherit his uncle's uh, company, but the board doesn't want another Huntington in, the, in charge, so Henry's out. He does get a, con a consolation prize of about 15 million, <laughs> which is the equivalent of uh, 400 million today. Um, but the inability to emulate his uncle and slash his mentor's uh, success in following to be the president of Southern Pacific, it really did have this profound effect on Huntington. So he sought to build a business empire that would rival and hopefully even surpass that of his famous relative. And he took the cash and went to Los Angeles, fully committed at this point. So in 1901, he incorporated the uh, Larry into the New Pacific Electric Railway, uh, PE, as I may say in the future. So if we think about Los Angeles, it really, back in the day, shouldn't exist. The 
<laughs> I mean, if you think about it, right? <laughs> like the Los Angeles River was a mess. It would flood and change its direction on the map all the time. And the only decent, decent harbor was uh, Long Beach. But San Diego had a bigger commerce center. And downtown Los Angeles was far off in the east. It was this huge, disconnected flatland. But where many people saw desert and mountains and ocean, robber barons of the late 19th century, they saw something else, a blank, a blank slate. The modern city of Los Angeles as we know it was created as kind of a counterweight to that of San Francisco at the time. San Francisco had very strong regulations and, and unions, and LA, Los Angeles was this open shop. So a businessman like Henry Huntington with his experience had free reign to develop. So with Larry, it was a commuting, they, they called it the yellow cars. It was this, a, a very commuting city focused transit center. The interurban Pacific Electric, its primary purpose wasn't actually as a passenger business, but rather a promotion of residential real estate. So the key to Henry Huntington's operations was to decide where development would occur by building a street line to where he wanted to develop ahead of development. Uh, and most frequently, he built these streetcars to land that he owned. So with his vast capital, he was free to select routes for his electric railway lines, and then he built them. Uh, and he explained in this strategy in 1904, it would never do for an electric line to wait until the demand, demand for it came. It must anticipate the growth of communities and be there when the builders arrive or they may very likely never arrive at all, but to go to some other section already provided with the arteries of traffic. So many of his red car lines were planned exactly in this manner. When people decided later to move to these areas, Huntington was already the developer ready to sell them real estate. You know, the red car was actually a lost profit. It was more of a portal, uh, to, because the point for Huntington was to get people to these subdivisions far away from the downtown center. Not only did he sell them real estate, but he frequently sold them water. He controlled some water companies. And in 1902, he established an electric company called the Pacific Light and Power Company. It was essentially set up to provide electricity to his trolley system, but he ended up selling the electricity to the city of Los Angeles. So he's a complete package coming down. He was the person with the right training, managerial skills, and the financial resources who, revive, who arrived in the right area at the right time. Map. Map. Thank you. So within less than 10 years, 1904 to 1913, Huntington opens, uh, opens up over 500 new subdivisions every year from 1990, uh, some, from. 1990, sorry, 194 to 1913, there we go. Uh, he controls over more than 900 red cars and built over 1,300 miles of track, which is about, to put it in perspective, about 25% more track mileage than New York City has today, 100 years later. Uh, the streetcar network that serviced downtown Los Angeles it sent, as you can see in this map, it sent areas to the foothills of uh, uh, communities of Glendale, Pasadena, Sierra Madre, Glendora, east through Whittier and La Habra. Uh, it went southeast to Anaheim, Santa Ana, and Orange. It went to coastal villages of Long Beach and San Pedro, Newport and Balboa, and it even went uh, southwest to Redondo Beach. And in 1910, the Huntington system was a detailed sketch for the whole Los Angeles that exists today, essentially. So historically, American cities, you know, they grow organically and, and, and almost in rings, starting with the downtown, and it expands outwards. But Huntington really forces Los Angeles to expand, expand outwards at twice the rate. So within the first two decades of expanding in Southern California, it was spectacular. From uh, 1900 to 1920, the population increased in Los Angeles City from 100,000 to 575,000. And with the count within Los Angeles County, it grew nearly sixfold from 170,000 to almost a million at 936,000. Some argue that this weekend, a down a weekend a downtown LA because he was creating these little downtowns along his trolley routes, but really he was creating this empire 
Uh, he had the trains, the electricity, he got the land, the water. Essentially, he was selling you your whole life. But all he needed now was the people. So back then, it was easy to not like cities. I mean, even today, a little bit, but they were, they were dirty and dangerous and crowded. <laughs> But Los Angeles was going to be this very different type of city, and that was the dream. All, uh, Huntington, along with some other power brokers, they went on a media blitz, and during the winters, they would advertise the Midwest and blanket them with advertisements that it was a paradise full of orange trees, it could cure asthma, <laughs> you could go surfing. <laughs> and, and, uh, right, and, and actually, you know, Surfing wasn't a big sport in California until Huntington hired a Hawaiian surfer named George Freef to surf along Huntington Beach. And it worked because for a while Long Beach was known as Iowa by the sea because a lot of Iowans lived by there. <laughs> so Huntington really had an influence on, you know, like where the passenger traffic was the heaviest, retail centers adjacent to the Pacific Electric Lines, they emerged, for example, uh, in Glendale, and you can still see it today, uh, merchant centers rose on either side of the Pacific Electric and on Brand Boulevard. And wherever his rail railway lines extended, undeveloped land was subdiv subdivided and you know, brought new real estate to the market. Because Huntington had this influence, he decided where the direction of the trolley lines went and because the access was crucial to successful real estate development, he, in effect, determined when and where the region would grow. But eventually, the stream would bust. You know, remember, just to make a point, that Pacific Electric was never meant to bring a profit. It actually brought a lot of loss because it was more of a portal, a mechanism to get people to go to these other real estate, the water, the electricity, to buy these bigger things of Huntington's. So the Board of Pacific Electric is not very happy about this. And at the, in the meantime, the red car is becoming a threat to Southern Pacific, the, the old company that Huntington hoped he would inherit. So P Southern Pacific wanted to buy Pacific Electric. Huntington says no, but his own board overruled him and forced him to make a deal with Southern Pacific. But in the end, Henry Huntington, he gets the last laugh. His uncle's fortune, Collins Huntington, was split between him and his aunt, and Henry Huntington's aunt, Ella, uh, Arabella. Huntington got a third, his aunt got the remaining. And, and during Hun, uh, Henry's time in San Francisco and in Los Angeles, he was continuously making trips back to New York to maintain the standing friendship with his aunt, as, and he would sell stocks from the company to provide funding for, to, to, to expand his lines. But, uh, so they, they, they do have history, and eventually this, this lovely Aunt Arabella becomes his wife. It was uh, his uncle's second wife, so not related by blood. And they consolidate their family's wealth and bring a lot of beauty and happiness to Los Angeles. You know, they, they create the Huntington Gardens, the Huntington Library. And I, I, I think Henry Huntington remains in a class almost by himself. He's a metropolitan entrepreneur. He dies in 1927. And at this, so 1926 was when it got sold over to Southern Pacific. And I don't know if Henry knew at that point, uh, but historians looking back do say that it was clear at this point that the red car was destined to fail. It was, it was doomed. Uh, here's a shot of a wreckage. Uh, the red car ran into a truck and it destroyed the truck. So even though the red car was extensive and had all these miles of trucks, uh, miles of tracks, it was never comprehensive enough to go everywhere you needed to go by red car alone. And eventually they became poorly maintained. There was this press uh, movement that went out to start talk, calling them the slums on wheels. A lot more cars started coming up, so there was traffic jams. There were these, these red cars were always delayed, never making their time. Yeah. <laughs> But the biggest turning point comes in 1926, a year before Huntington dies, Southern Pacific now owns Pacific Electric, 
and they have this massive plan to build subways and elevated trains all around downtown LA. It would be paid for taxpayers, so it went for a public referendum, and the voters ended up voting them voting it down. <laughs> well, I mean, to the public's credit, the uh, Southern Pacific was known as the octopus because it was so meddled in California politics for so long. And just to take a moment of this, this beautiful photo. Yeah, ships. The wheat export, actually. Like, yeah, that's, that, that is wheat export. And this, this, this was created, uh, I think, in, what was it, 19, I put it up there, 1982. So be way before this even happened, Southern Pacific was known to meddle in these politics, so calling it the octopus, to take a moment of this, we have wheat export here, we have stage, and then working down, we have stage co coach lines, we have fruit growers, freights and farmers and miners down here, wine barrels down here, Something called the Muscle Slough, where seven people were killed over a land dispute on where to build a railroad. So here are some tombstones that read, killed by railroad monster. <laughs> uh, and then the eyeball, okay, up here is Knob Hill, where the San Francisco elite live. And uh, including the eyeballs, Leland Stanford and Mark Hopkins. Um, and they're one of the, two of the four elite, uh, which call, call, call us Huntington being the three of the four, the, the big four, that membership that was happening. So anyways, moving on, people didn't have a really big public trust in Southern Pacific and they voted the whole, let's make a public transit system with subways and elevated railroads down. And going back to that original conspiracy theory where the car companies bought up the red car and tore them down to build freeways. So there's a little bit of a truth nugget to that. In that 1945, the yellow car, which goes back to the Larry system, the, the, the downtown car system, that was sold to a subsidiary of National City Lines, which is a Chicago-based company. It was backed by General Motors. National City Lines soon controlled close to 46 transit uh, networks in the Midwest and the West, including Los Angeles. And, the, and National City Lines was scrapping these electric systems and replacing them with buses and surprise, you know, that requires fuel and rubber. So they were buying trolley cars and converting them into routes. And people at the time even said, this is a conspiracy theory, this isn't right. And by 1946, the Justice Department, they caught on. It filed an antitrust suit against National City Lines for conspiracy to monopolize the transit in industry. Uh, this came to be known throughout the nation as the Great American Streetcar Scandal. But before this, the trial came to be in Chicago, all of the big companies, they bailed out, they sold their holdings to National City Lines, and it essentially left it as an empty corporation. So finally, in 1949, when the case came to trial, it was a mixed verdict, uh, mixed with ac uh, acquittals and the convictions. And even though the companies, they no longer owned national city lines, there was a, a, a wrist slapping amounts. They were fined with like $5,000 each company and individuals were fined, uh, individual company officials were fined a dollar each. It was, it was at, at this point, the highways, the cars, it was far flung across suburbans that was already developed. And it seems more than a conspiracy theory, it was more like a coup de grace to a dying system. And so that brings me to this whole thought of was this really, was the red car really a victim of a conspiracy theory? But when you look at the history of why the red car was developed, how it influenced the infrastructure of Los Angeles and the, the subdivisions around that area, it, the design was never to be this transit system, so it, in a sense was more of a kind of conspiracy. So as freeways became, and, and, and you know, like it, it does, it, 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 you can see how this theory would become cemented in the public imagination when you look at Map. maps. <laughs> 
of <laughs> freeways and the red car overlaid. Like you can see how these routes, it makes sense. These are the routes that people are getting, that the people are using to get around. And it would be left to the automobile, which actually did encourage development you know, beyond the trolley lines and to fill in and extend this outline. So that's what I was trying to portray in this map. But the basic spatial design of downtown Los Angeles and the surrounding suburbs, they were created by Huntington streetcars. And in some case, like the Cuenga Pass, trains were actually dismantled and tracks were dismantled to make way for the Hollywood Freeway. Santa Monica Boulevard today, if you're heading down to the 405, you'll actually drive over some phantom tracks. So in 1940, Los Angeles opened its free, first freeway, the Arroyo Seca Parkway, it connects downtown to Pasadena, Pasadena. And I actually remember when I was learning to drive, trying to take these on ramps. They're so, so short. And it's, don't like driving down that area. But uh, it makes sense. It's all clicking now. Um, you know, even then, if, uh, city planners proposed another plan for elevated railroads, and it was rejected by the city council. So at the time, with the amount of cars that were on the road, it almost seems like these freeways may have been an elegant solution to the transit problem. And they were the same freeways back then, but you know, with a much smaller population. So, well, I ruined that little build. I want to be up there. We go. So the Pacific Electric, it came to an end. It was sold to a private bus line, bought five years later by the Los Angeles Metropolitan Transit, and that eventually scrapped, scrapped the red car in 1961. So this is a, a clip from the documentary featuring the last red car in 1961. But it goes back to the more you learn about the history of Los Angeles, you start to realize that the red car was not necessarily a victim of a massive conspiracy but it actually kind of in part was part of the design. And it was a victim of its own success. Henry Huntington's goal was to connect his far-flung properties and create a decentralized city that you really do need a mass transit system to get around. The problem was he couldn't provide it. And over time, Los Angeles was so spread out that it just went beyond what the red car was capable of providing. And it goes back to Huntington, his operations were so much larger in scope than just trying to get people to buy his property and promote his subdivisions. Uh, they actually, in the end, designed a promoted metropolitan Los Angeles. I think although Southern California would have expanded in a major urban center without Huntington, it would have grown more slowly and, and the vast sprawl would have it would have had to wait for the automobile and may have resulted in a differently shaped basin dominated by a downtown center. And history has a way of repeating itself full circle because we've been spending billions of dollars, like the Metro Rail. In 1989, the Los Angeles Commission quoted, what we are trying to do is re-rail Los Angeles. Basically, we're trying to recreate the old red car system. You know, there's this investment to revamp transportation in Southern California, Los Angeles, such as the Metro Expo line and in and Lo Long Beach, the Purple Line extension. Uh, but you know, way back when, it was this hub, this the center of one of the nation's most extensive fixed rail transit systems in the nation. Thank you. <laughs>